Good evening, I'm Larson Halleck, owner and proprietor of The Barbaric Gentleman, fitness and nutrition columnist for Return of Kings, unlicensed personal trainer, musician, writer, martial artist, and bon vivant. But you already knew that. What you maybe didn't know is that I am an anthropologist by training, biological or evolutionary anthropology to be exact. For more details, Bachelor's of Science from Rutgers University of New Brunswick, New Jersey, on the Dean's List my senior year. And all of this, frankly, makes me as legitimate a scientific authority as Bill Nye. hi Welcome to Manthropology. This show isn't merely to flaunt my not particularly useful academic pedigree, but rather to discuss the field of anthropology in academic earnest. A field that is esteemed by all men around the world. Oh, did I say esteemed? I meant reviled. Yes, amongst men who have taken the red pill, so to speak, anthropology is not respected very much, if at all. Indeed, it's often seen as a major reason for why the cultural zeitgeist sucks as hard as it does. And I am inclined to agree. But I don't think it should be that way. And I think that if anthropology is taught and studied properly, Anthropology can be the most shitlordy of all the shitlord disciplines, if you will pardon such cloddish terminology. That is to say, if actual archaeological and ethnographic evidence is used rather than being swept under the rug in order to promote an ideological agenda. And so we come to the title. Well, how does anthropology make the world suck, Larson? To understand that, you must learn about one of the greatest ideological battlefields that you've never heard of, the anthropology schism. But to learn about that, we must first learn a little bit about this guy, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, he of the noble savage theory saying that man in his natural and primitive state is a gentle being, for there is no injury where there is no property to take. Also, let's learn about this guy, John Locke, the creator of the blank slate theory, which says that a man is born without any sort of inborn tendency, and that all things and behaviors are learned from experience. His theories, which were not based in any sort of primary sources or first-hand observation, have remained surprisingly popular since the 18th century. Now, if you were to go up to a modern leftist anthropologist and ask about this, they would vehemently tell you that they don't believe in noble savages, it's patronizing, it's racist, it's devoid of nuance. And yes, it's true, you will never see the term, quote-unquote, noble savage being used in academia today. However, the concept, the idealized idea, is still quite popular. Fast forward to about 1900 or so, and the study of anthropology, or ethnography as it would have likely been called then, has evolved a lot, and admittedly in some ways that were less than scientific most infamously those who leaned towards Galton's error, the idea that all was nature and could only be affected with biological means, which of course led to such pseudosciences as eugenics and various other justifications for racism and imperialism. A Columbia University professor named Franz Boas saw that in many cases the anthropology of his day was wrong, and he sought to amend that. To use anthropology as a means of ensuring harmony between the ethnicities and races, rather than being used as a justification for difference and violence. Indeed, it was he who introduced the idea of cultural relativism, which holds that no culture can be judged to be higher or lower than another, as they all have adapted to their particular place and time. A noble sentiment to be sure, but unfortunately he and his students, especially his students, they didn't fix the problem so much as tilt the scales of chicanery and pseudoscience to fit their ideology rather than the racist and imperialist ideologies of the time. What do I mean by chicanery and pseudoscience? Here's a very good example. In 1912, Mr. Boas published a famous study in which he showed that skull shapes of the children and grandchildren of European immigrants to the USA differed from the original immigrants. Therefore, so the study implied, different racial and ethnic types did not have a fixed set of characteristics, and therefore the idea of race is a mere false social construct. The problem was that this data was false. Mr. Boas thought it was more important to make a point about the rampant racism of his day rather than tell the truth. But don't take my word for it. Take the fact that Wikipedia has a whole subsection in their Franz Boas article about scientists as activists. Unfortunately, many of his disciples, 
both those who literally studied under him and those who have spiritually carried his banner since his death, focus entirely on the activism and the making a difference, most notably Margaret Mead. Who, if Francis Galton made an error that everything is based in nature, she can also be associated with an error that I have dubbed Mead's error, the idea that everything is based in nurture. She accomplished this by going to Samoa and studying gender roles, a subject that I will go into more detail about in another video to be sure, but needless to say, she combined wishful thinking, half-assed studying, and blatant fraud to paint a picture of Samoa as a peaceful gender-neutral utopia of noble savagery and sexual ambiguity, in which gender roles had no real practical basis to them, no more than the headdresses of chiefs signify masculinity or femininity. Mead's image of peaceful, matriarchal, gender-ambiguous Polynesians was for about half a century very influential in the world of anthropology, and it is still very influential in the world of gender studies, all of whom perpetuate a view of gentle, sexually neutral, noble savagery that really, really doesn't exist. And herein lies the schism. Starting in the 1970s, some anthropologists started to question and criticize these early 20th century theories, oftentimes because their own first-hand experience completely contradicted those beliefs in nurtured noble savagery. One of these anthropologists was one of my favorites, Napoleon Chagnon, who I will be talking about in another video. They sought to apply the theory of evolution and stronger, more objective analysis to the field of anthropology, both in terms of biological evolution and the evolution of social and cultural behavior, a new field that Edward O. Wilson dubbed sociobiology. Those who were more Boasian were, of course, completely horrified by the concept of biological analysis being applied to humans. They claimed that this was just one step away from eugenics and scientific racism. And, of course, in just another blink of the eye, we'd be herding minorities into boxcars to go to the concentration camp. The end result of this being that the anthropology departments of universities around the world essentially split in half into biological anthro and cultural anthro. The terminology may slightly differ depending on the school, and some schools completely got rid of one or the other type of anthropology, but that is essentially the nature of the schism. And that brings us to today, where both fields of anthropology, rather than acknowledging that nature and nurture are intertwined, are completely separate and rather venomous towards each other. As one of my Rutgers professors, Robert Trivers, said in one of his books, chapters specifically dealing with this issue, they think we're fascists, we think they're idiots. The result of this intellectual isolation? Leftist anthropology has essentially become a pseudo-religion, in which the noble savage is sanctified and any evidence to the contrary is seen as heresy. Again, don't take my word for it, take Dr. Chagnon's. For many anthropologists who cling to Rousseau's view of mankind instead of Hobbes, I am a heretic, a misanthrope, and the object of condemnation by politically correct colleagues, especially those who identify themselves as activists, quote-unquote, for the native peoples, simply because I describe the Yanomamo as I found them. Or take a look at the book The Harmless People, written about the Khoisan, purporting that these hunter-gatherers are noble savages, when in fact they have a higher proportional murder rate than Detroit. Or look at how leftists fell all over themselves to glorify the gentle Tassidae who kind of don't actually exist, at least not in the idealized noble savage way they were described. But the leftists took it as an article of blind faith that they were this way. And I deliberately used the term faith. Or how Edward Wilson was literally assaulted for being a quote-unquote evil Nazi racist eugenicist. Blind faith obfuscation, and violence against unbelievers. If I didn't know any better, these would all seem like the actions of the most chug-headed, Bible-thumping good old boy, wouldn't it? The idea of cultural relativism, developed with good intentions to stop racism, has since long become the basis of white guilt, intersectional oppression Olympics, and people being proud of having an idealized, ignorant view of cultures around the world, rather than understanding the nuance of world cultures. And, of course, the idea of the scientist as activist has certainly not abated. So, leftist anthropology can be directly linked to a lot of what we hate about modern society. Whenever you see some rich white liberal crying about invisible knapsacks, 
or see some hairy, barrel-chested man barging into a lady's bathroom claiming he's a woman. Even though I don't honestly think they wanted this. You know, this is Mead and Boas's legacy. For without them, we wouldn't have John Money ruining a Canadian boy's life. Or these assholes right here crying about how science and objectivity are white supremacist. With all that being said, as an anthropologist, yeah, anthropology has made the world suck pretty hard. But I don't think it has to be that way. I, to say nothing of anthro-heretics like Napoleon Chagnon and Henry Harpending, feel that a more scientifically accurate anthropology can not only be more academically sound, but in the end, make us understand other cultures better. Without hatred, of course, but without whitewashing and ignorance either. I'm Larson Halleck, and I appreciate humanity in all of its splendor.